Fantastic. Right, we're going to get into uh, a little series which we're going to look at over the next week called God With Us. Uh, Let's read from God's Word. We're going to uh, read from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 23. If you've got your Bibles, if not, it's going to come up on the screen. Isn't that a miracle? There we go. It says this, This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Father, I pray that you would come and move amongst us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us to really grasp uh, the depth of your word, the depth of your love for us as we consider this passage this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Joe, I think it's really easy, isn't it, to allow the story uh, of Mary and Joseph and the Christmas story to become over familiar, especially if you've been around church for a few years. I'm someone who actually was privileged enough to grow up in church. So the story of Christmas is very familiar to me. And yet, as Dave Mitchell reminded us, wasn't Dave great last week? Just if you, if you didn't get a chance to catch up on Dave's preach last week, amazing. What an honor to have him here. Um, and he just reminded us that actually there are many in society and culture today that actually don't understand and don't don't really know what the real meaning of Christmas is um, at all. Christmas seems familiar, but the story of Christ coming to earth is actually completely overlooked. And so this Christmas, we're going to spend the next couple of weeks just reminding ourselves of this incredible story, that this is a season where we remember that our God is a God of hope. I've got good news for this morning. There is hope for you. Wherever you find yourself, whatever situation you are in, there is a God who is alive and he wants you to know that he is a God of hope. We can have hope this Christmas time and reminded it through the Christmas story. And this is the story that we celebrate at Christmas. It's not just a one-off event that happened in history. The coming of Jesus as a baby To live on the earth and die as a man is actually the center point of all history. It's like all of history had been building up to that point. And his death and his coming back to life changed everything. And we are able to live in the light of that. Okay, that's really good news. So you can get, it's okay to get excited in church. It's okay to say, amen. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, we're Pentecostals here, so we don't mind that. So yeah, that's good news, isn't it? That's good news, right? Well, thank you, Jai. Excellent. And we're still living in that story. His life and his death is still having an effect on me today. It's still having an effect on on, on the world at large today. It's still, if you let it, having an effect on you today. And I believe it will continue to do so until the point where Scripture tells us that Jesus is coming back to bring everything to completion and make all things new. You know, Jesus coming to earth, the point in time that we celebrate at Christmas, it's not just a great story, but it's that pinnacle of history. It marks the beginning of something new, the moment where God himself comes to earth, taking on the form of a human being, clothing himself, scripture says, in humanity to walk amongst us, to die for us so that we would know life and we would know hope. And that's one of the marvelous things about there's so many incredible things that we can grasp when we really consider the story uh, of Jesus coming to earth. But the, the, the thing that just blows my mind is that God is a God who is proactive. He doesn't have to be bribed to come to earth. He doesn't have to be forced to interact with us. He's not a God that's seemingly far away. He's a God who is close. He wants to be with us. He wants us to know him. And him being with us is what we're going to focus on over the next few weeks. I want you guys to know and to grasp this Christmas that God is with us. He's with us. And as we dive into that, we're going to find, we're going to look at today that God is with us in our past. He's with us in this present moment, but he's also with us into the future. As we'll see, there's a God who's known you and has been pursuing you since before you were born. He is with us. 
There's a God who wants you to wants him to know you right here, right now, in your present joys and in your present struggles. He is with us. And there's a God who has a plan. There's a God who's coming back and who wants us to be part of his future. God is with us. And so today we're just going to consider how God is with us in our past. We can look at another scripture. This is Psalm 139, a very famous psalm. Right in the, if you don't know where it is, just open your Bible up somewhere in the middle. You're probably going to be pretty close to the Psalms. It's Psalm 139 and verses 13 to 16. It says this: "You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb." Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvellous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. What an utterly amazing piece of scripture. Do you know, I remember having a conversation with my parents not so long ago, um, and I'm sure many of you had this conversation, and the conversation was like what I was going to be called if I was born female. So I'm Gareth, I'm male, and they were going to call me, they were going to call me Steph, they were going to call me Stephanie. Um, And I remember this blowing my mind a little, it's like, wow, you guys were like planning like my name and stuff like that, before you'd even met me, before I'd even been given birth to, my parents were kind of thinking about me. Um, and as a parent myself, got three wonderful children, haven't I? Yes, that's right. Before our kids were born, we would talk about them. We would buy stuff for them, like, you know, a cot and clothes. People would give us gifts for them before they were even born. Uh, there's a picture coming up, which is a picture of one of my little, one of my little tinkers before they were even born. In the wood, that's its brook actually. And it, just an incredible uh, picture that inside that hidden place, inside Marianne, that we could actually sort of have a glimpse into um, uh, the, the kind of forming of the human. It's just absolutely incredible. But even more than that, scripture tells us that even before we were conceived, God was thinking about you, He was planning you. He had a direct hand in creating you and forming you and knitting you together. It says he watched you being formed. We had a little glimpse into one of of our children, and it was for, you know, maybe 30 seconds or so. God was watching you as you were being formed. You were not a surprise to God. You were not an accident. You were not some kind of blip. You're not some kind of disappointment. No, you are created by a God who loves you on purpose for a purpose. Known by God, even before your earthly parents knew anything about you. Our Father in heaven was with us. I mentioned earlier that Jesus marked like the hinge point in the story of humanity. And we see in the Old Testament, if you've read any parts of the Old Testament, that actually that God mirrors this kind of love that he has for you and I uh, upon the people of Israel. In fact, in Isaiah 44, it says this. But now listen to me, Jacob, my servant, Israel, my chosen one, the Lord who made you. And helps you, says, don't be afraid, O Jacob, my servant, O dear Israel, my chosen one. For many of them, oh, there we go. For many of them were born, they were living under the words spoken over them by God that we see in Deuteronomy 31, verse 8. It says, don't be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. See, there were many that were born into the nation of Israel, and yet God was with them even before some of them were born. He was with them, albeit in a different way. He was loving them and leading them before many of them were even born. And it's into that story that Jesus comes. He comes in the flesh, that even though the people of Israel may not have seen Jesus with their own eyes, he comes with flesh on to be amongst them and to remind them that God has been there with them even in their lives past. They may not have even realized it, but God wants you to know this morning that you are not forgotten and that your history has been building almost up until the point where actually you would realize it for yourself. Before you were even born, God was with us. He is with 
you. Let's look at another piece of scripture, Ephesians chapter 2. I'm just going to read verses 1 to 7. It said, so Ephesians is a, is a letter in the New Testament written by a guy called Paul. And he was a, a, a man who we think actually this was written while he was in prison. While actually he couldn't really do anything except just write some letters and encourage a few people. And this is what he says in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 7. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature... We were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for who are united with Christ Jesus. Now, we got any new book? Oh, yes, any. You're a newborn, newborn father, aren't you? Absolutely. Can you just tell me, just outline very briefly. Hello, Na- oh, little Nathan here. Can you just tell me, what's Nathan done to contribute to your family uh, since he has been born? Can you just outline exactly what he's done? Absolutely nothing yet. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. And yet we love him so dearly, don't you? And you are his father. Hello, my friend. Hello. Oh, yes, exactly. He, he thinks it's good. He thinks it's good. Do you know, when babies are born into our families, what do they contribute to us and to the world? Bit of noise, bit of poop, perhaps some sick every now and then. And yet we love them. There's a value on his life. He is so important to any and to Ivy and to us as a church family. And he's important to God. And that I think there's an intrinsic value on life, isn't it? It's given to us by God. We know that that, is, that, uh, that that is true. You don't have to teach someone that there's value on life. We just know it because it's built into us. And we're raised, we're fed, we're given the opportunity to grow. You don't have to teach anybody that. And I don't think this is an accident. In fact, Paul is telling the church in Ephesus that all of us need to recognize that God has been with us in our past. There was a time when none of us knew God. There was a time when, when, when all of us were so small that actually we didn't even know who this, who this God was. We didn't know how we came to be. And yet God still loved us. Scripture says, actually, what we were doing, for, for some of us who've grown up and maybe do understand who, who this God was, that actually there was a time when we were just running away from him. We were just following our own sinful nature, which basically just means we were doing whatever we want. And when you consider that Scripture has told us in Psalm 139 that God created you. He saw you. He knitted you together in the womb. You might think that actually for us who now are old enough to understand that, yeah, there's a God who created us, but I want to do my own thing, that he might be inclined to say, well, fine. I made you, but you don't want to, you don't want to have anything to do with it. Fine. Off you go. Forget you. I'm sure there's a song that says that. Forget you. I'm off. And that's it. And our relationship is over. Yet verse 4 states this, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much. He gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. We are loved by a God who does not give up on us. Even when we don't know him, even when we are too young to even recognize him, even when we're old enough but we run in the opposite direction from him, God is relentless in being with us because he is so rich in mercy. Now we need to understand mercy is a little bit different than just being nice to someone, than just being compassionate to someone. Mercy is the act of showing compassion to someone with whom you have the power to do great harm. That's very different from just being nice to someone. Mercy is the act of giving up any ability that we have to destroy someone, perhaps their reputation or perhaps even their life. We give up that ability and instead choose to show kindness. Even when we were not able to choose 
to give anything back to God, even though it is in his ability to cast us out, leave us for dead, especially if we've been through times in our life where we've actively run away from God. He is so rich in mercy and he loves us so much that he will not and has not given up on us. He is with us. And there is nothing that you can do to separate from this love. Paul, again, in Romans chapter 8, says in verse 35, Can anything separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us? If we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death, as the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day, we are being slaughtered like sheep. No. That's Paul's answer to it. In summary, no. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. In fact, God is so patient with us that he wants to always have the opportunity that you or I, no matter how far we feel away from God, no matter how far we were, he wants that opportunity for us to know that he is with us. And he's always been with us. He's so patient towards us. There are times in my life where I have definitely, I've gone in the complete opposite direction. And God, within his rights, could say, well, man, created you. I've got a plan for you. I love you. And could have said, fine, you want to go the other way, then forget you. But actually, he was so rich in mercy and so patient on me that even when we turn and go our own way, we look back and we realize that still God was with us. God is with us. Before we even knew him, he is with us. Final passage of scripture I just want to look at is in Ephesians 2 verse 10, one of my favorite verses. And it says this, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago, echoing the words of Psalm 139, building on those truths. Now, the next picture, I had to crop this picture just to make, uh, make sure it was appropriate for church. Uh, anyone know where, where, that's, um, where that's part of? Anyone know who did that? Sistine Chapel, that's right. And the artist was? Very good, Michelangelo, yeah. And so the bit to the left, it, it, you, you can go and Google it, but... Um, uh, This is thought to be, and many people say, this is his masterpiece. This is like the the, the pinnacle of his artistic career uh, painted in the 16th century. And it took him over four years to create. And yet, if you look in Ephesians 2, verse 10, God says to us that we are his masterpiece. God has been planning for you and has good things that he wants you to be doing, not just to give us a great life, not so that we would just be really comfortable and think, oh, we're really blessed by God. But God wants you to be part of the great story that he is writing to bring his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And he wants you and I to be part of it. He's been planning for you and I to be part of that. He wants you to know him more than anything else. He wants you to be part of what he is doing. And this is in light of the fact that, as we've just seen, God knows all about you. He knows those moments where actually you've said, I'm going my own way. He knows every single struggle that you have. He knows every temptation that you have. Every single one of them. And he has not given up on you. And Jesus coming into the world to die for us gives us the ability, whoever we are, And wherever we have been, to come under his lordship through faith in him and find peace with our God. God is with us. He wants you to know that today. He wants you to know that this Christmas. It's really easy to think that God might just be into a bit of cancel culture. You made a mistake. You made a wrong choice. So that's it. It's no going back. You've been cancelled. Just get on and just deal with it. Yet nothing could be further from the truth of who God is. I've been reflecting uh, with our leadership team on Psalm 32 recently. 
Um, a lot of airtime is given, isn't it, if you were to listen to anything, to the pursuit of happiness. Everyone really wants to be happy. Happy is the kind of the thing we all want to aim for. We want to be, you know, comfortable in that we've got enough money, enough food, enough of this, enough of that. We just want to be happy. The sweet spot of life. Yet Psalm 32 is a really interesting one because what it says is if you want to know joy, if you want to know real joy, real happiness, then it comes not from the pursuit of material goods or getting a great job or just having the right car and the right amount of money, but it actually comes from bringing our past before God and allowing him to forgive us and to lift that burden off of us. God is with us in our past and it is not for us to carry. And Psalm 32 reminds us that when we bring that before God, he wants to lift it off. He's active in doing that. And he wants us to find the joy that comes from doing that. He longs to take our past, our failures and our mistakes and trade them for joy instead. He can take your past, whatever it looks like, and make something beautiful out of it. That's who God is. He is with us. Do you know, we see this time and time again in Scripture. Don't just take my word for it. Open up your Bibles and you will see that you'll see from the beginning to the end a ton of people who made a ton of mistakes, yet God redeems and restores their lives and uses them for his glory. We see Jacob right at the start in Genesis who deceives his family by stealing his brother's birthright, being an awful husband by allowing his wife to be used by powerful rulers, yet through his family line comes the 12 tribes of Israel and ultimately the person of Jesus. We see Moses, the man who led the nation, I'm sure many of you know who Moses was, but he led the nation of Israel out of Egypt as a man who had privilege that he didn't deserve and was guilty of murder and desertion. Yet through him, the people of Israel and the nation of Israel became a nation and they were freed from the tyranny of Egypt and established as a nation. Much of the Old Testament writing is attributed to this deserter and murderer. We see David, who definitely was a murderer, possibly guilty of rape and deception, yet described as a man after God's own heart, leading the nation of Judah and writing much of the Psalms and much of the Scripture. We see in the New Testament, Mary Magdalene, who is apparently delivered from seven demons, so Scripture says, and is widely believed to be the person who is washing Jesus' feet, described as a sinful woman, a woman of ill repute, one of Jesus' closest followers and the earliest witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. We see Paul, who we've been reading some of his stuff. He wrote the majority of the New Testament. It's to him we owe our theology of Christ and justification by faith. And yet he was someone who was so zealous in his pursuit of the law that actually he killed and actively participated in the killing of Christians. And yet God redeemed and restored his life and made something beautiful. Guys, if if God can do it for those guys, he can do it for us. When you read the Old Testament and you see just how much the nation of Israel, the nation that was chosen by God, handpicked by God, that God's very presence was with them, how much they messed up and got things wrong. And yet through them comes the Messiah, Jesus, the one who will save the whole world redeeming what has gone before because of his great mercy and love. God is with us in our past. Don't write yourself off because of the past, because God certainly does. What right do you have to do it? If God is not doing it, God is with us in our past. He knows us and he has something prepared for us. And Christ's birth that we celebrate at Christmas reminds us that he will not give up on us. I don't know if someone needs to hear that this morning, whether you've just written, I've just done so much stuff. My past is irredeemable. I just, I've just got to just get, get, get on with that. I want you to know that God says different, that he does not give up on you. That your past is not irredeemable. That there is nothing you can do to separate yourself from God's love. God is with us in our past. Before we were born, before we knew him or even could know him, and he wants to bring life and restoration to you today. I want to finish just by reading this. and You've, You may well have heard this before. It's quite a famous prayer called the Footprints Prayer. 
But just as I was thinking about this, I thought this would be a really helpful thing that maybe someone needs to hear this morning. And the footprints prayer, no one actually knows who wrote it. A few people are fighting about that they wrote it, which is quite an interesting little story if you want to just Google that. But regardless of that, this is an incredible prayer and it it contains some incredible truth about how God has been with us in our past. And it says this. One night I had a dream. I dreamed I was walking along the beach with the Lord. And across the sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonged to me and the other to the Lord. When the last scene of my life flashed before us, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. I noticed that many times along the path of my life, there were only one set of footprints. I also noticed that it happened at the very lowest and saddest times in my life. And this really bothered me. And I questioned the Lord about it. Lord, that you said, Lord, you said that once I decided to follow you, you would walk with me all the way. But I've noticed that during the most troublesome times in my life, there is only one set of footprints. I don't understand why in times when I needed you the most, you should leave me. The Lord replied, my precious, precious child, I love you. And I would never, never leave you during your times of trial and suffering. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Guys, God is with us. He's always been with us. He's always going to be with us. And it may be that you've never realized that God was with you. God bless you, my friend. God was with you in your past. Perhaps you've always thought that God was out there somewhere waiting for you to do something, waiting for you to behave in a certain way, waiting for you to really understand this whole message of Jesus, live a certain life. And you know what? It is true that God invites you to come and live under his lordship, to surrender your life to him in such a way that he can show you who he really is. And in finding out who he really is, we find out who we really are. That is true. But scripture tells us before that we even thought about making that choice. And even if we reject it, even if we accept it, but messed up, God was with us. And God is still reaching out to you. No one is too far gone. No one is beyond the reach and the grip of God's incredible mercy and his incredible love. That is the message of Christmas, that Jesus came so that you and I could know and understand and see in flesh love, the love of God. That is so real. And as we discover, we find that it's always been real, that God has always been there. Like the guy who was writing that prayer didn't even realize that God actually was with me. I thought I was on my own, but actually that was the moment where God was carrying you. God is with us. He has always been with us. And his invitation to us today is to come at this Christmas time to him. Come and find hope. Come and find joy. Come and find peace. Come and find freedom from the mistakes of the past. Come and find your sin washed away. God is with us.